Object-oriented programming is a programming language model organized around the concept of objects. Objects may contain data in the form of attributes and procedures in the form of methods. Using objects, we can create adaptable and reusable code. This tutorial video will cover some of the basics of object-oriented programming as they relate to the early courses in the WPI RBE Unified series. For examples, we will be using C and C++. If you are wondering about a specific topic, check out the links in the description. First, let's talk briefly about functional programming. If you have some experience in C or writing basic sketches in the Arduino IDE, this is likely what you are most used to. Functional programming, like its namesake, works much like mathematical functions. Functions have an input and an output. The value of the output depends on the input. When interfacing with robotic hardware, functions can often lack an input or output, but instead have some sort of real-world input or output that is defined in the body of the function. On the left, we have the classic Blink example sketch. Often the first sketch uploaded to a new Arduino board to verify that it is working. On the right, we have the same program converted to a functional paradigm. From the main loop, we call our function over and over again. When the call is made, the LED pin and the duration are supplied as arguments. This way, we can reuse our code by calling it for different LED pins or different durations without having to copy and paste the four original lines of code over and over again. Now on the right, we have a more advanced version. This code calls a function that increments a value while a button is held down, and then returns that number. This number is then fed into the previous blink function. Note that the code in the main loop can be simplified. The variable is redundant as the function acts like the variable it returns, so it can be put inside of the other function's call as an argument. Objects provide an additional layer of structure for our programs. We now call our variables inside our object properties and our functions methods, both of which are members of the object and can be either public or private. Making our members private prevents code from outside of our object accidentally changing its values. To access this private data, getter and setter methods are usually created. Use of public properties is generally discouraged as it leaves data in the object vulnerable to change. This practice of restricting data access to an object's components is called encapsulation. Encapsulation is important to keeping your code robust, especially when working on a team where you can't always be sure how other team members' code is going to interact with yours. Objects are defined by classes. A class is like a blueprint from which multiple instances of an object can be created. A class is made with two files. The header file, .h, which contains the basic definitions of all the properties and methods defined within the class, and the code section, .cpp, short for C++, which contains the actual programming defining the functionality of the class. Now we will look at an example of programming under the object-oriented paradigm by looking at a class you may be familiar with, the default servo library. Although you may not have realized it, Every time you use an Arduino library, you are taking advantage of object-oriented programming. Here, in the Arduino library folder, we can look at the servo library. Inside it is the SRC or source folder, which contains the files that define the library, servo.h and servo.cpp. Note that the name of the folder, header, and cpp files must be the same. The Arduino IDE does not support editing .cpp files, so to edit and develop libraries using another IDE is recommended. The Eclipse IDE with the Slover plugin can be a much more powerful development environment for the Arduino, especially if you want to work with objects. Now we have on the left one of the example servo sketches, and on the right the servo.h and servo.cpp files. This line includes the library so that our sketch knows what we are talking about when we type the keyword servo. Now we create an instance or object of the servo class called myServo. This section of code in our class definition is the default constructor, and it gets called whenever we create an instance of our class to set up the default structure of our object. In this case, an index is created for our servo, and the default pulse width is stored in reference to it. The servo object needs to know what PWM pin it is using to communicate to the physical servo, so we will use the class's attach method to set the value for our object. When myservo.attach is run, this section of code executes and saves our pin to servos.pin.number at the index of our servo. When the attach method is called with one argument, the first function is called. It in turn calls the overloaded attach function with more arguments, min and max, the min and max pulse width. 
It uses the default constants for these values in the call. Overloading allows us to specify more than one definition for the function. The program knows what function to use based on how many arguments we supply. If we wanted to, in our main code, we could call the attach function with the min and max arguments in order to specify the bounds of our pulse width, and it would call the overloaded function below. With our object instantiated, we can now use it. To access members of the object, we simply use our object's name, dot the member. In this case, we will use myservo.write, parenthesis, value, to move the servo to a specific location. What happens next is defined in the servo write method. As we can see, it simply checks the value to make sure it is in an acceptable range. If it is not, it truncates and scales it accordingly. Lastly, it calls the write microseconds that writes the actual timed PWM signal to the predefined pin. There are several other important private helper functions. For example, this function converts microseconds to ticks. However, this covers the base functionality of the servo library. Now that you have seen an example of an object in the form of the servo library, we are going to work through making our own objects. We will not be going over turning our objects into an Arduino library, but if that is something you are interested in, check out the supplemental links in the description. Creating a new object can be a great way to break down the physical components of our robot into reusable chunks of code. We can also take advantage of composition when creating our object. That is, we can have an object that itself has instances of other objects inside of it. For example, let's say that we have a robot that has two robotic arms. Each arm has two joints controlled by servos, a servo-controlled gripper at the tip, and a limit switch in the base of the gripper to determine if an object is touching the back of the gripper. We could create an object with all of the methods needed to interface with our arm. When selecting the things that will be in our object, it is important to follow the single responsibility principle the first part of the SOLID acronym, an acronym describing the five key principles of good object-oriented design. For more on these principles, check out the supplemental materials in the description. The single responsibility principle states that our class should have responsibility over a single part of the functionality of the program only, and that that responsibility should be entirely encapsulated by that class. For example, our ARM object should include all of the actuators and sensors in our ARM but should not include sensors or actuators from other parts of the robot. And, the parts of the arm should not appear as members of other non-arm objects. Create a new tab for our objects by using the drop-down menu in the upper right corner and type in roboarm.h. Remember that the Arduino IDE does not support .cpp files. The IDE does, however, let us treat this new .h file as both the header and the body of our new class. To make our new class visible to our code, we will need to include it. Simply put, include roboarm.h at the top of your sketch, as if you are including a library. Now let's move over to roboarm.h. We have already implemented this class and will now walk through our implementation. At the top, you will need to include arduino.h. In a normal Arduino sketch, .ino files, this is automatically included and hidden. We will also need to include servo.h as we will be using servo objects. This top section acts as the header file and contains the declarations of all our public and private properties and methods. Here we have the default constructor, which is left blank as we don't really have anything we need to set up when the object is first created. We have, however, created an overloaded default constructor which simply calls the attach method by using a pointer to itself. This allows other people using our class to completely set up the object when it is instantiated. A pointer can be thought of quite literally as a section of code that points to another, much like how a page number in a table of contents points to a page. For more on using pointers, check out the supplemental materials in the description. Below we have our basic members. They allow us to set specific servos to specific positions and read the limit switch. More advanced functions are implemented below. The save and go to position members allow us to save a position to a private variable and then later we can ask the robot to go back to that position. However, this approach is limited, as we can only save two positions. Consider how this could be implemented for end positions by using object-oriented programming. Furthermore, even more advanced members could eventually be implemented to handle functionality such as forward and inverse kinematics. This concludes our introduction to object-oriented programming. Thank you.